and welcome everyone. If you are uh, joining us for the first time, uh, you are at the right place uh, where we have been uh, discussing international business issues since April 2020. This is almost 70 plus webinars on a weekly basis we've been offering on behalf of the Cyber Network, Centers for International Business Education and Research. Uh, these are federally funded centers of excellence in the United States. And uh, we have also allied with, partnered with the Academy of International Business, uh, especially the uh, shared interest group that relates to teaching and education in offering uh, some of these webinars. And today we have one of those. I'm Professor Tamer Chavushkil, joining you from Georgia State University Cyber. And today we have a very uh, topical, very important, very relevant discussion uh, for international business educators as well as practitioners. Uh, I feel like we're going to learn a lot, uh, be informed by distinguished panelists. And, and I think given the events of the last several weeks, this topic has become even more current, more contemporary today. Uh, just a couple of notes. Uh, we do record these sessions and they'll be available on our website, Georgia State University cyber website, as well as on our YouTube channel. So if uh, some of your colleagues have missed this, uh, you can share the link with them and they'll be able to uh, view them and, and share them with others as well. When you exit the, uh, uh, the webinar, and today's discussion is 90 minutes, uh, there will be a short uh, uh, survey that will come in an email from us. Please respond to five short questions and give us some feedback and suggest uh, webinar topics for future events. Uh, I should also mention that uh, this is the last in this academic year. We take a break for the summer and come back with a lot many more webinars in September and, and do uh, look at our, our, our timetable for that when you have a chance. Everyone except the panelists uh, is muted in the webinar. Uh, please use the Q&A button uh, for comments and questions and we'll have uh, opportunities uh, to look at your quest questions and comments and respond to those as well during the discussion. Uh, so there will be also our, our uh, organizer, uh, Osreen Shlansky. Uh, Professor Shlansky will put together some resources for you, especially those of us who joined us as educators uh, that will be helpful in integrating blockchain topics into international business. So those will be mailed to you uh, after the webinar. So with that, uh, let me just say a couple of things. So we are, I feel like I'm gonna learn a lot and there's never enough that I can learn, uh, especially about this contemporary topic. This, uh, the, the, the terminology itself can be very confusing, right? The blockchain, crypto, distributed uh, ledger technology and non-fungible tokens and Web3 and so on. But this is, this is a reality. And it's a big part of international business and the digital economy we find ourselves in. So today, our, uh, our uh, gifted uh, panelists are going to talk about the underlying principles of the blockchain and blockchain business, uh, base business, uh, and, and global reach of these businesses. Obviously, they are ubiquitous uh, businesses. Uh, and uh, cases of blockchain beyond Bitcoin and several other uh, cryptocurrencies, and even we'll get into, I believe, uh, uh, setting up uh, blockchain-based businesses internationally. So I would like to just recognize our moderators who organized this uh, panel and brought together our, our panelists, uh, Ostrin uh, Shlesky, Professor uh, Shlansky is joining us from University of Vasa, Finland. Uh, she teaches in the School of Management and holds a PhD in International Management. Her research uh, reaches into strategy regarding in, uh, multinationals, 
and certainly blockchain adoption in, opera, in IB. And, and also she has a deep interest and a gifted uh, master teacher in international business. She's certainly leading the AIB's Academy of International Businesses Teaching and Education Shared Interest Group, which I mentioned at the beginning uh, as a sponsor of these webinars. Uh, Austrian is an alumnus of the prestigious Nord IB program. She has won several international awards for her research as an educator. And prior to academic career, Austrian worked in Lithuania and Egypt in several international positions as a manager. Austrian, thank you so much for joining us and moderating this discussion uh, today uh, with us. Thank you, Tamir, so much for your very generous and broad introduction. Um, I, it's wonderful to be here, and I would like to say hello to everyone joining us today. Um, and it's great to have so many of you from different parts of the world. You already said the greetings, and, and we are honored to have you with us. Uh, I would like to thank GSU Cyber Team, especially Professor Tamir and Paula for fantastic teamwork when organizing this webinar. Although the credit was given to me, that's not exactly the truth. It was a brilliant teamwork. And Academy of International Business and especially Teaching and Education SIG are absolutely blessed to have partners like you. Uh, today, we have unique opportunity to learn from industry professionals about emerging topic, which is bringing technological revolution to business, which is blockchain. And we learned last week from senior IB scholars how important it is to sort of get back to industry and learn from, uh, from, from it to remain relevant in academia. Uh, GSU Cyber has earlier featured a discussion on fintechs, touching on the topic of blockchain, and the recordings of these fantastic webinars are available on GSU Cyber website. In this webinar, our goal is a bit different. The major reason why we organize this webinar is to onboard as many IB educators as possible to this complex topic. So blockchain is going to change every part of our lives very soon including the way we publish and disseminate research uh, as platforms such as Research Hub already emerge. And thus sort of it's better for us to understand and start discussing it now and as soon as possible being able to shape the innovative future together. The challenge to onboard this topic usually is complexity as Tamir already mentioned. And I must confess that I'm researching the topic actively for a year now and there are so many things that I don't understand yet. Uh, and blockchain related innovations, they're changing, they're very fast, they are, uh, they're really sort of different and there are so many difficult terms involved with them. So it's hard to follow and understand. And in this webinar, we'll try to introduce core issues in a very simple language, simple as possible. So if you are an uh, expert in the field, you may wish to sort of have double check uh, about how to introduce this topic in a simplistic way. And if you're just starting to explore this topic, you'll, you'll sort of, this is your chance to get into it. So your questions are very, very welcome. In this endeavor, we have a help from our outstanding industry professionals we have today. So Alexander or Sasha Muzilin, uh, Laura Cornelia Inamedinova and Andrus Bartmenas. Uh, a brief overview of their fascinating achievements, uh, and I'll try to do it quick so we can get into the discussion soon. Uh, Sasha is a co-creator of Human Guild, and he was also a very active developer of Near Ecosystem, which is one of the most advanced ecosystems in the industry. Sasha invested tremendous amount of time in uh, trying to create materials and discussions around the topic and to sort of, again, try to onboard as many users as possible. Uh, and Sasha is going to share the, uh, the information about the resources together with us today, in addition to the invaluable insights in the topic. Laura is a CEO of a London-based blockchain-focused uh, seven-digit marketing company. Uh, Laura is an inspirational female entrepreneur, uh, noticed by many outlets, by many institutions, and absolutely um, not leaving the stage of all the main blockchain conferences, I must say, and I absolutely lost the count on how many keynotes and speeches she has given so far. So we are absolutely honored having her with us today, also learning from her uh, insights. 
Andrews uh, is a CEO and founder of uh, SuperHow, a private research and innovation lab focusing on dark technologies. Uh, Andrews has led fascinating projects and uh, also a lot of institutional work. So if we think about the institutions that are emer emerging, the old regulatory framework that is coming out now, um, so SuperHow is actually a founding member of INADBA, International Association for Trusted Blockchain Applications. With, this is one of the parts where Andrews have made fascinating contributions, but also he has worked in many, many uh, discussions uh, with government and institutions uh, in Lithuania and European Union. It's amazing to have you with us. Thank you so much for joining. Um, this discussion will be structured in four parts. So we'll start with a reflection on concepts. Uh, then we will explore use cases so that we would understand this broad variety of opportunities and, and businesses coming together uh, with, the, uh, um, with the, uh, this new technology. Then we will discuss about business development and we'll end with some future trends. And audience questions are very welcome in Q&A and we'll try to incorporate uh, all of them as much as we can in every section of our discussion. So without further ado, let's go ahead and let's untangle this fascinating, uh, crazy technology. Uh, Andreo, can I ask you, what is the difference between blockchain, distributed ledger, cryptocurrency, metaverse, and Web3? That's, you know, a bunch of fancy terms, but let's start from you and let us, let us try to understand. Please help us. Yeah, so uh, there are some concepts that you have mentioned and there are some technologies. Uh, so Web3 is a concept uh, basically which is uh, built upon the decentralizing and democratizing the uh, internet itself. So it is everything about the user, the user is at the center, the human is at the center of the, of the internet ecosystem. It is about the semantic webs, uh, making the content more relative to, to the user making the privacy as one of the key components of the internet uh, and uh, management of the private data, uh, decentralized communities, decentralized uh, identities, and everything uh, basically what we are uh, talking about. And most of all, I would say that uh, uh, Web3 is not only about the democratizing or decentralizing, but the other thing is owning things on an on internet in a decentralized way. So making the things ownable first, you know, in first in a lifetime of the humankind, actually, which is due to the blockchain technology that we have mentioned. So the blockchain comes with uh, quite a big opportunity and promise for helping to build that web three uh, concept, uh, make it real. Of course, there are lots of different. Uh, different, uh, how to say, approaches and, and discussions. So now more of the companies, more enterprise companies are focused on 2.5, like this in between of uh, Web 2 and Web 3. But uh, us as a company who is working in the innovation field and research field, we see that the Web 3 is the ultimate goal to go, to go for, and the blockchain is a technology. So the blockchain as a technology is a decentralized, digital ledger. So not all DLTs are blockchains, but the blockchains are decentralized DLTs, making, uh, meaning that they are at the essence decentralized as an infrastructure. So uh, what does it mean? It means that there is no super admin, there is no administrator, there is no leverage over the infrastructure. So anything that you do, it is open, it is transparent, it is open source, it is open to use. And basically it, it takes the trust as a word out of the picture. So this is the most critical part to understand. So trustless ecosystem, trustless uh, system, trustless interfaces and, and many more. So cryptocurrencies by design, this is the economical part of incentivization of that decentralized blockchain to work. So some, someone has to distribute, someone has to distribute the power, someone has to uh, give uh, infrastructure to, to maintain that, uh, that, 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 that network. So cryptocurrencies are the native uh, currencies of the network of any blockchain network that the miners or uh, node operators are paid for their job 
by supporting the network. So as many decentralization, as many nodes you have, the stronger network, the stronger uh, security of the network is. And the decentralized consensus model, proof of work, proof of stake, or any type of decentralized is the biggest innovation of, of, of it all. So basically it's, it's the fundamental part of the, of the blockchain. So uh, apart from cryptocurrencies, which are native tokens of the network, there are tokens who are like, they can be in a different forms, different uh, types, different uh, essence behind them. So NFTs, like non-fungible tokens, which are unique objects, digital objects on a blockchain. Uh, we have utility tokens. So like uh, applications on top of the blockchain that has their inner economy token for using that application uh, and many more. So uh, there are interfaces like explorers, like wallets. So uh, there is a big misconception that you're holding tokens in a, or cryptocurrencies in the wallets. So no, every cryptocurrency, every token is on a blockchain. And wallet is the interface for you to interact with those tokens, with those assets by signing them with your private key. So basically it's a keychain where you are holding those private keys and signing the transaction. So okay. this is a yeah. short. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let me stop you now. You've been throwing quite a lot of explanations and now let me untangle that a little bit so that we go slowly, slowly, step by step that we okay. really understand what, what we are meaning, right? So now you said we have to sort of disentangle a couple of things. One thing is the technology itself and technology was blockchain. And blockchain is a specific kind of technology, right? Now, yeah. let's return to this. Let's return what's so special about technology as a blockchain that it enables so many things that we're going to return to, right? So blockchain as a technology, you mentioned that it uh, sort of makes the concept of trust different. The concept of trust is based on economical incentives that are out there. Is it so? Uh and yes and no. So okay. the trust is based on that decentralization, that mm -hmm. level where you don't need to trust one or two or three people, but you are trusting the ecosystem. So meaning everyone who is participating and that trust is basically built on the technology, which is cryptography, which is decentralized consensus model. So how we, you know, how we agree who is like, what information is, uh, is valid and uh, what blocks are valid and what is true and uh, so basically the trust is the infrastructure the technology itself so by by that it's it is a very difficult uh, uh, how to say perception for uh, like just the usual uh, guy uh, from the usual business uh, that you don't need to trust some uh, for example some business or some uh, institution or some licensed uh, institution that uh, uh, before the blockchain, they were uh, trusted because we have put the trust into them. And by being that trusted infrastructure, so basically cryptocurrency, so when the people are asking, where is the value of the cryptocurrency? So the value is that trust that you are putting in that infrastructure, actually making things happen. And as much it is secure, as much it is decentralized, so the the utility of the network itself is stronger. So that okay. is the trust. Okay, and we definitely return to the trust aspect because already we have uh, participants commenting about the collapse of some stable coins and so on and so forth. So we definitely return to the issue of trust. But now let's return to the technology itself. And here I would turn to Sasha. Uh, about the consensus mechanism. So now Andres mentioned that we all trust because we sort of have some specific mechanisms of trust. And uh, obviously the network, a database, basically what is, an, uh, what is sort of a new type of computer or a new type of database, which is blockchain, the trust is arranged through specific uh, consensus mechanisms, how we all agree about how things are done. Sasha, could you comment a little bit about these mechanisms? that are uh, active in uh, blockchain and why they're so special? Uh, yeah, I mean, like it was kind of important po point of discussion, maybe like around 2017, 2018, when people were kind of like designing the layer ones, uh, 
think they yeah they, they vary so they're like different trust assumptions in each some of them have like half of the half of the network needs to come to agreement some of them have like two thirds of the network that have to come to the agreement um but yeah i haven't been actually hearing much about consensus as of as of late at least in the last couple of years so do you want some particular uh particular maybe you could in general say what are the consensus mechanisms and how do they work in a very simplistic way so how does these network participants that are they all connected through the technology how are they reaching the consensus for the network to operate mm -hmm. on proof of work proof of stake and these kind of a little bit of basic concepts of how this works out mm -hmm. so the way it looks it's pretty much like a public database it's uh, uh, that's run by a bunch of different nodes instead of one corporate server let's say like facebook is run as an application and then they bought like let's say ten, tens of thousands of servers and that's where all of the data for facebook is residing blockchain is different in that uh, it's a database on which a bunch of different applications built, but actually the nodes, the servers are run by different kinds of people all around the world, uh, across uh, different uh, geographies. Um, uh, they, they also vary. So like there are like more bigger nodes, like let's say like you have approaches like Solana who have like more like bigger machines that you need to run. And you have like our approach uh, for when you're it's more like sharded systems where you uh, you focus on small servers but the idea here is that a bunch of servers um, are run and people need to see the validators are the ones who need to see which transactions actually going into the blockchain and verifying those and um, the consensus is built in such a way where uh, all of these nodes all of the servers all these people can come to agreement on, on the transactions that are going into the block of the blockchain, um, even though there are potentially malicious actors in the system. So that's kind of like the idea is that you have, uh, you have potentially uh, malicious actors potentially in the system. And even with them, you can come to agreement. Uh, and that's a kind of a big, kind of like an innovation that the blockchain kind of brought to the table. Kind of how do you solve this Byzantine, um, like, or what's the word? Uh, I'm forgetting, I'm blanking on some <laughs> jargon. <laughs> No worries, no worries. And now actually I'm grateful that you brought this issue because Carol is already sort of commenting and question at the same time. So you, you just mentioned that we may have a bad actors there, but we still sort of uh, kind of a come to trust and come to the consensus. And Carol is asking, so if we're moving to sort of trust based on from the institutions to trust based on technology, meaning sort of code is law uh, uh, to, 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 to this kind of concept, how do we get a person, a general person who is now listening to us, trust the technology that they don't understand? Why we would trust the technology uh, and why we would rely on this sort of new concept they're offering? And uh... yep. I definitely would mention that it's very important to do your own research. Like uh, not everyone needs to be trusted in blockchain. I think blockchain is very, um, uh, very similar to early internet in that there are people who are trying to kind of just take advantage of the situation. In addition to uh, to what was happening in early internet, let's say like early 90s, here we're also talking about like reinventing money to, to, to the extent. Um, and so with that, you have even more kind of like scammers, so call it, in the system. And so it's I would recommend people to do uh, their own research. Definitely, I see some questions here in the chat room about like Terra and other collapses. I think we're going to see more of those. And so I think it's uh, people who are interested in participating in in those systems they need to really understand like what is happening what is this blockchain what is this underlying protocol and i think in the last couple of years especially people made assumptions that like okay like i think this thing is running for a couple of years it seems like everyone is using it let me just continue uh, put my own money to to this and 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 so i, th so we, I think we saw with collapse of terra a couple others as well as attacks on bridges bridges are the systems that connect different blockchains so those are also and and, and they've been pretty like vulnerable in in different sense than terra but we saw they are kind of like both situations where people lost a lot of money and there were assumptions that like okay i think everybody's using it let's just um, go with this um, and, and so I think it's very dangerous um, to kind of blindly trust the, the particular thing without like fully understanding it. Mm -hmm. I Laura, put some... hold, hold right. a second. Laura, Laura was waiting uh, for, for mm -hmm. Addy. Ladies so first. <laughs> yes, ladies so first. So one thing uh, I would like to remind everyone that blockchain is a technology still very new. 
how many years to mark 10, 20, there is nothing there. And basically nowadays, everyone who is doing any kind of project, they can ship it up to the market. Well, basically the same day they finalize their code. Whereas in other industries that are more established, it takes time to kind of get some certain approvals, get, let's say, a license. If we're talking, let's say, uh, pharmaceuticals need to go through research trials to get basically the product ready for the consumers. Whereas here, it's still wild, wild west. Everyone is doing whatever they want to do. Only a handful of countries all around the world have some sort of regulations on how can we actually regulate certain technologies, certain currencies. And basically, in one hand, we can see that we're facing and we're experiencing something new is being uh, basically born. A uh, new way how people, first of all, work together. If we talk about DAOs, how people think about money, how overall money is being shaped in our industry. Everything is super new. And it's normal that people are building products, not thinking it through, releasing it, and they're clashing. They're uh, some of them being uh, going to bankruptcy. Because like it's so new and no one knows what's happening, what they're doing, and there is no like clear set of rules how you build a blockchain company. Whereas if you're building anything else, there's probably going to be a regulation, there's probably going to be some kind of document which you can follow. Here, everyone, as uh, Sasha said uh, very well, need to be very cautious. Because if you're going in something new that is unregulated, you need to know about the risks what are associated the same way if you would try some kind of drug without taking into account the clinical trials probably it might not end up being such a good drug. So the same way we need to think about all the currents, all blockchain businesses are still very new and not going through all the right round of approval from the government or other trusted parties. And now I give the floor to Andres. Thank you, Laura. So I just wanted to, to bring some, some light into the trust issue and the blockchain technology. So uh, all those tariff cases bridges so their applications on top of the blockchain and for example terra case it's a manipulation from the market with big uh, uh, big leverage of assets and then deep pockets so it is not a technology but a humankind who is basically the flaw and uh, looking from the technology side so blockchain i don't know in the history of the blockchain yet any blockchain technology that was actually hacked as a blockchain technology, as a blockchain network itself. So there were there were like there were hacked like bridges, which is uh, due to the you know left uh, um, malicious uh, like bugs or some 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 you know uh, some holes in the coding. Uh, there is a misconception of how you like have to secure your keys, and you're just you know miss uh, miss uh, like misplacing them and basically it's not a technology but the, the human who is a flaw in in that in that essence and the technology itself it's beautiful and it uh, enables lots of different things as laura said like how the humans are interacting how the ecosystems are built and uh, that is not a technology that is you know fault right so the first takeaway of today, technology is innocent, humans is a problem. So if we want to learn about the blockchain, first of all, we have to explore and take the risks sort of related to it. It's an open code and the technology is evolving together with a lot of experimentation around it. But now let's turn to this. Okay, so technology is there and it's operating, but there are a lot of problems with coding and other things that are on the way. And another element is cryptocurrency. So you brought this in, uh, also already mentioning that cryptocurrency is a sort of one of the way for incentivizing and creating value in the network. And this is a big innovation, obviously, of, of, of this technology that we can, whatever we do, we can add value to it, even in browsing in the internet, right? So why, Arvind is asking, why is digital currency necessary for the trust in the blockchain sort of network or in general in, in this kind of a new crypto economy? Why we have to have it? I can answer that question right away. So it is necessary because the trust is built on that decentralization. So you have to have a strong decentralized network. So meaning that the network is supported by as many nodes as you can have. And uh, the nodes are the hardware. So it is the service or any type of hardware that is used to support that network. So basically the network itself is built on that hardware. 
And you have to pay somehow, you have to incentivize somehow the person who is providing that for the network. So he is doing the purpose. He is actually giving you the opportunity to have that network. And cryptocurrency is a meaningful way of uh, paying him for that, you know, for that, uh, for that invaluable thing, which is trust. Because basically what we are buying by, by using the blockchain, we are buying the trust and buying the trust, which is uh, built on the decentralized uh, community. And all those know they don't each, they don't know each other. So it, if it is quite good decentralized network, so there is a very, very like minimum chance that uh, you will be able to collude or to, you know, to, to know, know each other, to do something. So that is the essence and how to incentivize people to, you know, to, for example, to pay for the server like 100 euros per month, for example, uh, just to give that, you know, uh, opportunity for other people to use it. So there is no way you have to have some meaningful way of, uh, uh, of paying them back. Okay, so Andrew, can I make some sort of maybe not precise, but a uh, parallel? Is it the same mm -hmm. like paying for our internet provider? We pay for internet provider to get a service and here is sort of not direct, but kind of a fee to get an access to a network. How accurate that would be? We might say that uh, it, is, uh, it is some parallel that you could uh, use as an, as, a, as an example, but usually in, in, in a provider, you know who is a provider, you know who you are paying uh, to. But in a decentralized blockchain, you don't know because that, you know, there is a gamified incentivization consensus mechanism that basically even node operators, they don't know when they will be paid because there is a, like, there's a cryptographically uh, enhanced uh, mathematical problem to solve. And that who solves that problem gets the, you know, uh, network fees and gets the inflation. So that's how proof of work is working. Uh, proof of stake is working that you're staking you're putting your collateral at stake uh basically and there is a uh, this lottery which is basically selecting one ticket uh from the batch and that is rewarded so there is big uncertainty behind that and you're basically paying to the network you don't know who is the provider and the network itself is settling that uh, that part of who is getting paid Right. So now we're returning to Carol's question again about the trust. And here comes sort of this idea, which now you mentioned and we didn't bring before. So blockchain is not just a sort of meta computer or a database, but it actually operates by solving a puzzle, right? By solving some sort of a problem that is given into to the technology with some specific um, with some every specific operation. Right. And whoever, whichever computer technology wise solves it, that one gets incentive, right? And this is yeah, where the yeah. trust comes. Is that so? Sasha, I see you're opening yes. the microphone. That's a, for proof of work. Yeah, that's for like older systems. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, then, then, yeah, the new systems, they're like a bit more simplified. People just like lock mm -hmm. the capital into this and you don't need to uh, solve the puzzle anymore. So it doesn't waste energy, which ended up being a big issue for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, so what is the difference between proof of work and proof of stake? So proof of work is a physics and proof of stake is a politics. So uh, basically uh, when you are doing the mining, when you're doing that mathematical cryptography problem, so there is a, uh, so how to prove that there is no bias in the network that you don't know who will be paid. So the payment has to be random and it has to be you know, uncertain. So that is the only way how you can, you know, uh, build that decentralized network healthy so that mathematical problem is a way how to you know how to make that randomness how to make that, that trustworthy randomness uh basically and everyone knows that it has it he he or she has the equal chance you know to participate and to get paid with proof of stake the randomness is in a lottery so it is like uh, uh you you by staking some uh, amount of cryptocurrency or actually like something similar as buying tickets so how much uh, you know what how big is your stake so it is bigger chances to get uh, you know rewarded there are even with proof of stake there are more different like protocols there's proof of importance proof of elapsed time and many more but uh, basically everything is about uncertainty and making things 
uh, decentralized even how this payment is provided to the network supporters. And this is a beautiful, beautiful side. Mm -hmm. And now if I want to participate in this network, in this stacking, in this uh, whatever mm -hmm. happening there, Arvind is asking, can I pay the fiat currencies? How do I enter the network? How do I start operating in it? Yeah, so you have to go to exchange to buy cryptocurrency and then uh, start staking. So there is no way of, you know, until you're using some third party service that I'm not recommending. So there are services who are providing, you know, uh, like you can uh, like just easily uh, upload, uh, like top up uh, the fiat currency and uh, go and stake. But it is already, you are not trusting the network. You're trusting some third party, which could be some scam or some, you know, centralized uh, something that you would not be like involved with and i i never recommend that so the better part is to go to exchange to exchange that uh, that cryptocurrency for uh for the current uh, cryptocurrency that uh, is needed and then do uh decentralize the real thing by yourself wonderful and now I would like to turn to Laura and get back to these concepts that we build on this fantastic technology and new models of trust. So Web3 and the metaverse. How do we build these concepts? Where this blockchain comes into those when we talk about these new kind of creations? Uh, so, so before I think I'm going to go a little bit deeper into metaverse or concepts, I want to take a little bit step back and talk about overall that blockchain has a lot of different applications, a lot of different amazing opportunities. And here, as everyone who's educator and listening in, I think this is crucial, crucially important to learn that could spread the word for all of your students to kind of take their hands off if they want to go into blockchain. So when you're thinking blockchain and we're thinking about technology, it might sound scary. It's a technology. I don't know how, how to program. Like I come from marketing background, so I'm so far away from there, but you want to get involved in it. There are so many ways how everyone can get involved Well, as starting a business. Would it be metaverse? Would it be NFTs? Or would it be a DAO? Or they can participate in a lot of uh, different uh, ways. It could be investing in a currency, even though it's a very risky thing. It could be running your own, for example, node where you can either do proof of work or proof uh, of stake. You can stake money, as Andres uh, mentioned uh, himself, and help to uh, verify, for example, Cardano transactions. Then you can also participate in a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization, where you can basically be the part of the business of the it's a great idea and get paid for doing some sort of work for it for it to grow and then as you have the tokens you also can vote on how business basically being uh, operated and what's super cool about DAOs is basically what we see in a world that people are tired of what's happening with our democracy how people in the government basically ruling uh countries or how company uh, CEOs are ruling the companies and like, hey, we want to have the voice, want to be heard on the company's development. That's why they're creating DAOs where their voices are being heard. So basically what's super interesting and what definitely worth exploring maybe a little bit uh, down the line is how basically people using blockchain as technology in numerous ways are trying to solve the problems they have in real life where they feel probably powerless to make an impact. Let's see, no, we're not, if we don't like our government uh, think about our monetary, for example, policies, can we realistically do something? Probably you have to get elected, run for government, then lobby your way up and maybe change something. That would be 10 years probably. Whereas blockchain technology, you can do it way fast and have a bigger impact. So overall, all the blockchain gives the opportunity for people, for, first of all, get their hands on and have the real impact in the world rather than uh, being just a bystander. And when we come back to a question, let's say metaverse. So metaverse is, first of all, it still is a very, very early concept. So if we're thinking blockchain is in our like, concept itself, actually blockchain is an 
ancient history compared to the metaverse, if we want to put it in that scale. And I see Andres is nodding his head agreeing with me. Metaverse, I, I like to say, is, it's still just a culture thing. It's still a vibe. Basically, everyone wants to go into metaverse. They want to have their work there. They want to socialize there. But actually, uh, when we think about metaverse, we think it's basically a virtual reality. And when you think about the virtual reality, number one thing, what you think is about the glasses. There is still no uh, comfortable to use hardware to enter the metaverse. And, all, and we have Oculus, we have some other players. They're still super expensive and uncomfortable to use. So our entry barrier to metaverse is already super high uh, and inefficient. That's number one thing. Number two, there are still very few proper businesses who can give the right experience to the end users and consumers in the metaverse. So it's just starting out. It's probably going to be a big thing 10, 20 years down, uh, down the line. But still, nowadays, when it comes to the metaverse itself, is just a very, very early, I would say, first few steps going there and it still has a lot of issues still needs to be improved uh a lot i personally believe it's going to be a big thing but only like 10 20 years down the line hey laura thank you so let me pick up a little bit on your comments so first about this democracy model that you first brought up uh, so we started from discussing risks and we jumped very quickly into all these risks that you that we sort of immediately mentioned and noticed However, originally sort of blockchain has emerged with this idea that um, kind of a, it, it actually improves the trust mechanisms. And specifically that we have the international business educators. So if we think of the countries where there are plenty of institutional voids or where institutions are not functional, maybe they are corrupted, maybe there is uh, some lack of access to some of the institutions or in order to get to the institutions, you have to uh, do other kind of a social services or bribes or whatever we want to call them, right? So in this case, blockchain sort of nullifies this uh, element and brings the technology about above everything. And we've seen quite a few cases where uh, a lot of participants, specifically from emerging markets, are joining the blockchain so enthusiastically because the risks that the blockchain is bringing are probably less, um, seems less to them than the risks that they face due to this institutional voice that they are having in the country. So that's one part of it. And then, Laura, you were bringing about this uh, virtual reality or metaverse. And that's some sort of uh, like, if I understood you right, it's a virtual world. And the blockchain role in that, could you now just crystallize that idea? So metaverse is a virtual reality, but where the blockchain comes in there? What's the point why we are relating metaverse with the blockchain? Uh, so there are numerous ways how you can use blockchain as technology in metaverse. Uh, I how I see it from the marketing world. Basically, we already had virtual worlds uh, uh, for many many years. There were some games, for example. There were uh, some other concerts, uh, social media, basically being on top. But it wasn't that sexy. It wasn't that interesting. And when you mixed blockchain with metaverse and use blockchain for example via nfts and i can go a bit further down about it when we think about the tokens it's based just another layer to make it more interesting and appealing for the user and one more uh, interesting thing is nowadays people who are in the blockchain community who care about currencies they're those pioneers are going to be building the technologies of the future and if you want to basically introduce a new concept of the generation of tomorrow, a very futuristic concept, you want to go to people who are going to be uh, receiving that well. That's why I think from more like cultural and novel marketing perspective, why metaverse was kind of tied so much with blockchain, even though we already had like virtual reality, we already had glasses beforehand, it wasn't something uh, new. So that's more from like the cultural marketing thing. I think the guys from the technical perspective can share also uh, more inside how that kind of relates to the technical part and where are those key things that maybe the marketing part is missing and then the blockchain can bring in. Fantastic. I can maybe give a comment on that also. So uh, uh, we as a research and development lab uh, metaverse see a little bit differently. So it is, uh, yes, virtual reality, I, I agree. So this is the type of interface that you are uh, having. But basically that, uh, you know, a metaverse is actually the 
uh, the digital world, which is the alternative reality of the of the of the basically what we are building in this digital uh, in the this digital actual world. And uh, and uh, why blockchain and why now? So as I mentioned, the blockchain actually creates the first in the world opportunity for humankind to have and own like things in the internet, in this digital reality, in the digital world. And that is the basic. So when you're, when you're living the physical life, so you own things in physical life, you're actually living in that physical life. And when you can have the digital you know, assets in a digital life, you can live in that digital world. You can interact with in that digital world. You can work in that digital world. You can build whole new, actually, reality, new concepts, new everything in that digital world. And yes, virtual reality is one of the things that is a better immersive you know, interface to the internet. But uh, I think there will be much more advanced uh, technologies to interact, to interface, uh, Neuralink, some other technologies that will be able to, you know, to stream the, the, the network straight to your head or straight to your mind. And uh, basically, this is just, uh, you know, the problem how you're interfacing. But uh, the metaverse itself is that digital world, which is uh, basically decentralized. And why decentralized? So we don't want to live in the world which belongs to Facebook, to Meta, to Google. You want to live in the world which is free, which is liberal, where you can have the democracy, you can have privacy, you can have all those things that you know this new generation internet is promising. And that is the metaverse. This is the meta world or meta something. But uh, that is a beautiful thing. One more thing to keep in mind, and I want to kind of challenge a bit. And just yes, people want to live in the world that is basically centralized, that is your safe, their information safe. But nowadays, most of the metaverse is still centralized, and still there is some company behind They're it. They're not the metaverses. Don't, they co don't consider do themselves metaverse. I suggest and they we leave that. this uh, discussion a little bit away, but I see Tamir has opened the microphone and uh, would you like to ask your comments something? Yeah, very interesting discussion and thank you all of, all of you for your comments. I mean, very enlightening. Uh, I'm just thinking about my student uh, asking me, uh, Professor, you know, how is blockchain uh, creating opportunities for industries such as gaming? I think Sasha may want to talk about that. You know, what is it that we can do with blockchain and how does it enable uh, the evolution of new industries, new enterprises, new businesses, as well as uh, impacting existing businesses, uh, creating competition for them, maybe jeopardizing their competitiveness. Maybe Sasha, you can go through a scenario of, uh, okay, how do I use blockchain for gaming applications, for example? Yeah, I can start with maybe like a couple of sent sentences on like, why is it generally useful for uh, like developers, founders, and then talk a little bit about gaming too. So blockchain space, I think gives, can I call it like weekend developer or like just um, your, um, founder, uh, two big superpowers. One is um, open instant, open instant, open execution of, of services. So, you, so it's different from open source. Uh, open source existed for the last 20, 30 years. Um, kind of like it took a while, but it kind of like won over. Um, uh, if you, if you look at the technology industry, in addition to this, uh, blockchain gives uh, founders, developers, opportunity to use uh, open uh, instance of the of the open service. So whatever, let's say you're building insurance application, right, um, on Ethereum, and you want to take advantage of automated market maker, like something that trades one coin into another. Well, there is a service that's actually not only open, but fully running live, and you can plug it in into your business and, and reuse it. And so that gives you like essentially like superpowers. So you can just plug, plug and play things that other people build. Um, and by the way, all these people incentivize to work together as well. The second superpower is connection to financial markets. So a lot easier you can, you can connect directly as a founder, as a developer to financial markets. So those two things make, I think, blockchain very appealing to like your average like weekend developer or something like this, because uh, no longer they're competing themselves against like large company like Facebook that is very hard to compete with, they can actually, um, they can actually like succeed this time around. 
Um, when it comes to gaming, so gaming on blockchain is very early um, and it's very complex. And the reason is, is so you need to you need to build uh, very fun games still. It's still the case. Nothing changed that people pay for, for games as a form of entertainment, same as movies and, and, and uh, music. It's not like some kind of like new magic way to make money or something like this. Uh, there was a little bit of a hype last year with like play to earn and such in, in, in blockchain. Um, but you need to combine fun game with open economy. So that, that's a big, uh, big thing that uh, uh, blockchain brings to the table when it comes to gaming is the economy itself is open. So you can actually take advantage of the market um, and people will be uh, trading things peer to peer fashion. So, so for gaming, when gaming was offline, when there was no way to trace things as, uh, or enforce rules on things, uh, gaming used to be kind of like fully capitalist and people were trading with each other. For example, Magic the Gathering, a card game that exists in the offline world does not prohibit from, from people trading with each other. Uh, when it uh, moved to online, um, like the best example of like Magic the Gathering equivalent online is Hearthstone done by Blizzard. That one actually was prohibiting people from trading with each other. So there is a game developer or the studio cor corporation that decides essentially what is the market, what is the price for a particular item, who gets to trade, who doesn't. Uh, and blockchain basically says like, and, and there were gray markets actually that still existed on forums and people trading with each other, kind of like still trying to bypass those rules. Blockchain is basically saying like, okay, this is all legal now. So <laughs> whatever this trading was on the side, now anybody can do it. And so we need to combine the open markets with really fun game and nobody has done it still. I think we see a lot of like experimentation, um, but uh, it's, it's very early there. I think those are the main challenges. Uh, legal is another challenge and uh, Hiring blockchain still uh, still early, but I think the output of it, like what we'll see on the on a other side of it, is we'll we'll see compelling games, like fun games to play, but also with the opportunity to have like robust economies inside of those games. And another piece is that those games will be able to talk to each other. So unlike the games that exist today, where one corporation has its own kind of like a system, its own game, its own its own economy. Uh, now the games will be able to actually connect the communities between games will be moving between games. The assets is the kind of main way how people move across those things. And by the way, it's applied not just to games. It applies to like applications, like the internet will be interoperable because of the blockchain. It will be like open web as opposed to walled garden web. Um, and then... Um, yeah, so that's 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 kind of like the main thing. So like developers get to become a lot more powerful because of blockchain. It's not specific to block uh, to, to the gaming, uh, and then gamers will be able to own their assets, which they were not able to before, um, fully and and monetize them if they leave and choose to play other game. They'll be able to trade within each other as well, and I think it it will just like be a lot more complex economies combined with just as fun games. So I think it's. Uh, something that we'll see in the next couple of years, but it will be like a lot of experimentation on the way there. Excellent. Thank One, you so much, Sasha. That's very useful. If I may uh, maybe ask a very naive question, let's take an uh, you know, existing industry like banking, financial institutions. How, how, is, uh, how is blockchain changing the way they do business? Uh, could you just comment briefly on that? Yeah. Anybody? Really? I, I have a little bit of a story on that. Maybe it's like one... Mm, one, uh, one opinion, maybe it's not uh, true because I haven't been as actively talking to like enterprises recently, but um, so we started near protocol in August of 2018, roughly almost like four years ago, actually. And big chunk of my early days of near like 2018 was actually talking to a whole bunch of enterprises like JP Morgan's, Bank of America's, Facebook's and like Walmart labs and such and figuring out like, do they actually need blockchain? Uh, it, it, was it uh, kind of like hype driven? Kind of like there was a lot of conversation in the previous like uh, bull market 2017 about how it's needed by enterprises. And I kind of like wanted to establish whether it's actually happening. They're actually going into deployment, adopting this technology. What I learned at least at that time, again, I could be wrong uh, in terms of like what's happening now is that it was majority of it was not like real use cases. Like for 99% of those use cases, you would be just okay with database, <laughs> with like the, the current technology. Um, and uh, those, uh, there is also a lot of like, um, there is a lot of like inherent um, uh, competitive kind of tension happening in those industries where they don't like a lot of time sharing data be between each other. And then when you come in and say like, well, like there is actually like this new system, we can all share data. It actually doesn't work as well for 
quite a few of those institutions. So what I saw is that majority of the use cases which required cross kind of like banking, let's say conversations and such all across other enterprise conversations, they kind of didn't go anywhere. And then um, there were the ones where like it's within one company, kind of like those kind of like seems like we're working better. Like for example, like maybe trade finance within Bank of America and their partners, those use cases kind of like progressed a bit. But what I saw is that there was a lot of proof of concepts. There's hundreds of proof of concepts, but very little of like actual deployment of, uh, of blockchain technology in enterprises. So I'm still like skeptical and it's like very much painted by this experience of 2018, but I also could be wrong. Thank you so much. That helps. I have I have experience also uh, maybe to share. So uh, we are working in, in so we have one in, in inside project in Soccer House. So we are building the infrastructure solution for a securities market. So everybody knows that securities market is highly regulated, and so there are lots of different intermediaries, licensed uh, institutions that are basically working for a trust issue. <clears throat> and uh, and now we are building this infrastructure, which uh, could basically uh, put out out of business uh, the uh, such uh, institutions as central security depositories, for example, DC, DTCC in in, in US, uh, settlement houses, clearing houses, uh, even centralized exchanges, centralized markets, regulated markets. Because basically the blockchain itself, it is a trusted infrastructure, like you can decentralize. So for example, if you could uh, decentralize at institutional level, uh, the blockchain itself, for example, just build a consortium network uh, with uh, market participants who has licenses to issue the securities and do accounting. So uh, basically uh, you should have, or you would have the trusted infra infrastructure for issuance of the securities, for settlement of the securities, because Basically, having money on the same infrastructure could help, you know, to settle uh, instantly, not uh, two plus two, uh, T plus two, like T plus one or other settlement times, but have atomic settlements and uh, settlement finality. So we are working now and uh, we have also experience of building uh, blockchain infrastructure for central bank digital currencies. So we did experimental project together with our central bank and European central bank. And we also proved that blockchain infrastructure is much more secure and efficient with uh, any type of transactions with money and issuing money and uh, uh, reconciliation, settlement and lots of different things. And of course, uh, yeah, a whole like credit system could be built on, on top of that. But first of all, you have to have assets tokenized. And uh, that is the biggest opportunity. Fantastic. One more interesting thing, uh, Chad, there are actually already banks uh, that are doing the thing. So for example, in Iceland 2019, there was a company, I think Monerium, if I'm not mistaken, the name, who actually had one of the first Europe, uh, basically e-monies that had all backing from the government's nerving. I'll find article share it in the comments. There's actually Gunnar Sword doing that. Also, one interesting thing uh, to mention in US, there was an USDF consortium basically made where they were planning to have the first table coin that's gonna be mint exclusively by US banks and will be redeemable on one-on-one -on -one basis for cash from all the members' banks and offer as an alternative to non-bank stable coins. There's actually already talks by banks having their own stable coins. And here, when we're thinking about blockchain technology, the future is for stable coins, something that is not fluctuating 30% up, 30% down in a matter of 24 hours, something stable, one-on-one -on -one redeemable, either to the currency or let's say gold or other precious commodity. And that's gonna be probably the entry how the mass adoption of cryptocurrencies will start. Fascinating. So now we are sort of discussing a lot of finance industry, but if we think that technology, uh, blockchain as a technology has huge potential to enable us to do different kinds of businesses. So if we think about the principles, if I am entrepreneur, if let's say, or if I'm teaching students about developing international business, how blockchain can help me? What are the principles that it changes international business and it helps developing international business? When I think about blockchain, I'm not sure if it's like business, I'm just thinking like it's inherently international in the sense that like, for example, today I have like certain calls uh, with people like from Brazil, Ukraine, 
uh, Portugal, like it's like inherently international. So I think um, I think that's a big part of it. And by the way, like it's also connected back to metaverses that we talked about. A lot of these people hang out in virtual spaces. That's how they kind of meet. And a lot of times actually more engaging than let's say Zoom call or something like this. And I'm noticing that more people asking to hang out in the virtual spaces. Maybe it has to do with like ADD or something. But yeah, when I think about blockchain, I think it's just inherently international. Um, but business part, um, I think it's just like more like a way to do commerce, but but I don't think about it as like bigger businesses adopting it. I'm thinking about it's like a bottoms up thing. Okay. In what way it enables bottom up? Sort of in what ways it enables, especially small companies for internationalizing or getting global immediately, right? Like what you said, it's immediate mm -hmm. global. So in what specific ways, maybe you could explain how it helps me to do business differently than uh, earlier, building on earlier technologies. Mm -hmm. So again, I wouldn't think about it as like business. I would think about individuals, maybe like let's start with individuals. So there are people who can bring value to other people, right? And like, for example, like music musicians, artists, podcasters. Um, and so these people now have a, a, a lot easier way to reach their audiences. They can build direct relationships with their audience. The distribution is still hard. So there'll be like 1% of the people still like long tail kind of thing where people will be able to get distribution successfully, but blockchain enables them right away to market things to the world. So for example, I have a friend who used to go for 15 years to San Diego to Comic-Con and was trying to just convince this one guy that like my comics is worthy of kind of like putting on a bigger distribution on like actually sold by, by this particular distributor, by publisher. And now he doesn't have to do that. He doesn't need to convince anyone. He just can put uh, put his uh, work um, online, and essentially anybody can participate. So in that in that sense, it opens up um, opportunity for like all kinds of creators. So I think what happened on the internet in the last like 20, 30 years is that particular type of creator got like paid really well. That's software engineer, and then there are a whole bunch of other creators that kind of like didn't really benefit from the fact that we are now all interconnected. And so I think I think uh, blockchain inherently enables those kinds of people, uh, but I think it's less have to do with like existing big businesses. But that's just like my opinion. Absolutely. So if I want to decide, do I need blockchain in my business? How do I decide it? When do I need blockchain? And of course, it is sort of you said there are specific kind of creators, right, that are enabled by the blockchain's presence. How do I know? Do I need this sort of blockchain coming in my business or I don't care about it? Laura, so you were opening the microphone. Yeah, I'll open it. I'm probably going to pass it to Andres as he to, helps companies to develop the blockchain. But I had this really nice uh, panel in Paris Blockchain Week, I think like a month ago, where there was the same question like, hey, how does a company, especially corporate, decide do they need blockchain or not? And the conclusion there was first understand what is the problem you're trying to solve and then think what are the best solutions for it and if blockchain is one of it that's great because what people see nowadays and not just with blockchain with nfts with metaverses companies are doing that just because of marketing and as a marketing agency we love it but the more marketing is the better for us but actually in some cases you don't even need blockchain you don't even need nfts and you need to understand are you doing this because you need it as underlying technology to solve some kind of issue or you need it just because you want to get some PR. So for example, there was a huge campaign like Balenciaga going into Metaverse. Gucci, for example, did a collab where you could buy a virtual uh, sneakers, uh, which cost, I think, $12. And all you could do is just use them either, in, I think, in the central line or scan it through your phone and see it virtually on your uh, feed. And it was sold out within a day or two. It was super good. Do they actually like need this technology? No, but do they need it for marketing? Yes. So when it comes to overall decision, uh, I think Anders can come in more from the technical perspective. But first, it's really understanding what it is the problem you're trying to solve and what is the best course of action, regardless of blockchain or some other technology. Yeah, I think uh, Laura said it all, but uh, there is like. There are two types. So you're solving problem. Uh, usually you're solving the market problem. Uh, and th that problem lays with the problem of trust or problem of decentralizing things. Also, the blockchain is about building the ecosystems, ecosystems of your user, uh, better engagement with, uh, with your potential users, incentivization mechanisms, uh, gamifying the interfaces. So lots of, for example, uh, play to earn 
not play and earn, but uh, it, they, was, they were designed for GameFi industry. So how to make the DeFi interfaces more, you know, understandable for people to use. So by playing, you are basically uh, providing liquidity or doing some DeFi, you know, uh, work or DeFi uh, value for, for the ecosystem. But usually for, 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 for just enterprise business, it is not so easy because uh, they have to rebuild the whole uh, business model as they have. So none of the existing centralized business model, in my opinion, fits into the blockchain because uh, it is still how the value is distributed, how the ecosystem is built. And uh, that is the biggest challenge uh, coming from the you know classical big enterprise business to go into the blockchain because the, mind have, the mindset has to be different. And besides of that, there is a second part, which is not solving the problem, but basically making the magic or making the dreams that, uh, for example, solutions doesn't exist yet because of that decentralized, of that, uh, uh, that free, because that new opportunities opens up uh, to you as an entrepreneur just to take that technology and to do something that uh, people just yet doesn't know that they need. And uh, some of those are more, I think, uh, important than just solving problems because we need to dream. We need to build something that, you know, pushes us beyond that uh, just living or just using and which empowers, which creates something, you know, beautiful. To what extent you would agree that the primarily selection criteria to have blockchain in your business part is actually the nature of the business, meaning, let's say, are your transactions uh, frequent? Are they repeated? And how trustworthy transactions uh, they have to be? And if this element is not there, then you may not need the blockchain. I would say that the biggest part is still we know the trust. So if the trust is needed, so the blockchain fits usually. So for example, a registration of intellectual property, time stamping of events, uh, lots of things, but still those all things has to be fully automated. So if there is a you know part of the of the process that a human being has to put information or do something. So usually that, uh, you know, human flaw always uh, spoils the, the beans and uh, that is the, 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 the weakest uh, link in that process. So the blockchain is beautiful where you have the fully automated process where you have certain things and you need that trust from the, from the, from the blockchain itself. So for example, fintechs are, uh, why, why financial technologies, why finances so is, is, is the first in the line to do that tokenization and blockchain adoption because there is a big uh, demand of trust when you are interacting with money, with value, with something valuable. There is less uh, needed when you are like transacting with something that doesn't have so much value. But, uh, but uh, still, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, uh, the trust is the, the biggest, uh, that, that point which actually starts thanks to just consider the blockchain and then many more like incentivization models like uh, building the ecosystems and uh, decentralized governance models and centralized like democratizing everything about right so it's not only building the business but also it's financing the business what sasha was also mentioning that yeah. there the blockchain brings totally new models of financing the business we don't need uh, sort of the same type of uh, funding schemes that we had before is decentralized and anybody can invest. And that's where international business probably is beautiful that you can get investors from any country in the world without need to establish trust otherwise. So talking about the challenges, what are the challenges developing a business with the blockchain in mind or in its uh, DNA? So first of all, it's probably finding the right people. So hiring nowadays, uh, all of our clients are struggling finding first developers, the right marketing people and other ones because the industry is so new. And finding people with experience is definitely a challenge. And then you have to basically pay uh, way more above the market average. That's number one hiring. Then if you man manage to find the people, then doing marketing as well. Uh, one good thing about overall the blockchain ecosystem, there are a lot of players with a very good marketing budget. So if you're a small company, you want to buy 
ad share, you want to wise some PR, you want to host event. The prices for any marketing activity for blockchain is usually two, three times bigger than any other industry, let's say tech. So we also work with tech companies. So any usual, let's say a fee for the conference sponsorship is like say two, two, from two to 10K for tech company. Blockchain companies usually start from 10K just because this is industry. So you definitely need a higher budget. Then uh, number three is building uh, trust of your project. As the other panelists already mentioned beforehand, People are very scared to trust a project and they are not uh, putting their money straight away and not using product straight away because there were a lot of really bad actors in the industry basically shedding the light on it. So building the trust is number three was definitely a challenge. And number four is really finding your market fit. There are a lot of projects being built just for sake of building a project, which is great to do if you're student, you want to start out, it's always good to fail and test it out. But if you're building this because you think it's going to be an in easy industry because uh, there are so many stories in the media of companies making millions, attracting a uh, huge amount of investment, that's not true. Especially nowadays, the market is being fleshed uh, out uh, by all the drops. So that means only the true companies, with the right value proposition, with the right product will basically survive. So here, it's very important to find the right market fit that you're like, to just raise the money in the beginning, it's easy, but then to actually bring the product to market and have the user base, that's where the challenge is coming, uh, basically for everyone trying to make a name for themselves. Great, Sasha, would you like to add something from your perspective, particularly that you had such a great uh, experience in the whole ecosystem development and bringing people in into the ecosystem? Yeah, I can talk uh, maybe about challenges as well as how ecosystems kind of develop, develop uh, kind of from ground up. So I think uh, just generally speaking, like innovation takes a lot of experimentation. So the way kind of like Ethereum, uh, when Ethereum started, maybe like, let's say six, seven years ago, since then we saw a couple thousand people trying uh, different kind of tinkering, trying different things. Uh, East Global is a like very important organization. They were able to figure out how to do like one hackathon per one major city per month for, for a while before COVID started. And what it really, it really helps. Essentially, there was a lot of experimentation, like rapid pace of experimentation. Again, thousands of, of projects across maybe three, four dozen use cases, 95% of them failed. So it took six years and like 95% of them failing to then get to the place where it's like, okay, Ethereum actually is good at like high value, low volume transactions, like lending works really well on it and, and, and several other things. Uh, and I think similarly for us, like we're building different blockchain, we started it, it it's kind of younger blockchain with different uh, technology underlying it, uh, more useful for like web scale use cases. But the challenge for us, for example, more like not the challenge how to build business, but challenge um, in terms of building ecosystem is that people try to replicate success from other places. They see something successful, let's say like NFT marketplace or lending protocol or AMM, something worked on Ethereum, and they immediately try to replicate it on, on Nier. Uh, and we have like many of those, but the challenge is that we need to on our own go through the same path that Ethereum did. So another six years of, or probably more than that, of many, many, many hackathons, many experiments, people try and failing and then discovering through this, what are the new use cases for blockchain? Because also let's be real, the amount of use cases for normal people in blockchain today is still very limited. Uh, it, it's still very, very early. Uh, for example, uh, recently, a couple of weeks ago here in San Francisco, Solana, another blockchain was doing activation event. They, they worked with coffee shop and essentially provided free ice cream and free NFT for everyone who kind of from the street just wanted to give it a try. And so for 90% of people who were on board, it was like very good onboarding. A lot of people got excited, but the very first thing people did who never encountered blockchain was like, okay, well, um, I heard blockchain has some money in it. I got NFT, where do I sell it? So 90% of people were literally trying to get offboarded from, from blockchain the moment they got onboarded into it. So that just tells me that like amount of use cases and the challenges to our industry is that amount of use cases are still like very limited. We have some things working in decentralized finance, mostly like lending, um, automated market make makers, other trading tools. We have derivatives, insurance, uh, access to stablecoin becomes very important, by the way, for places like Ukraine, actually, it's actually right now um, more demand for stablecoins than it is for American dollars, by the way, which is like super interesting. Um, and uh, so I think that's, that, that's kind of like um, 
I think one of the challenges is like limited limited amount of use cases for the for the uh, ecosystem growth. When it comes to the business, I think the main trade off for for building business like let's say gaming uh, as one example is you can build it in a traditional space like mobile game or for pc or for console that's inherently very competitive but uh, also very established so you know how much it is for, for marketing standpoint how much it is to uh, uh, get one user into the door right like it's, it's very like established in terms of best practices but it's also very very competitive uh, blockchain is more like opposite it's like um, nothing figured out <laughs> like it's very complex and nothing figured out um, but it's also not that competitive. If you actually bring something compelling to the market, uh, people will actually use it. Um, um, so that's the kind of like idea. It's a greenfield space, the new space where nothing's figured out versus um, the kind of like established space where like it's very competitive, but also um, the best practices are established. So I think that's generally speaking how I look at like Web 2 versus Web 3. Wonderful. Andrew, how about the legal issues? There's so much uncertainty around it and you were working so much with institutions and trying to push them forward. How friendly at the moment environment is and what kind of specific challenges are the biggest one when developing business with blockchain? Uh, yeah, so, so with regulation, I think uh, there is a big, big, big misconception of institutions and regulators so my opinion is because of how decentralized uh, you know internet is working and what is meant for it is more should be put to the self regulation not a regulating trying to regulate it out from outside of the of the you know the space that you're trying to do that because uh, still the blockchain the crypto ecosystem the the web3 the metaverse is a is a totally different alternative reality which is very difficult to regulate from you know from physical world i understand that touching point where you you have money and you have like centralized services like uh, centralized exchanges but DeFi, uh, everything that is purely decentralized that is a big challenge to, to to regulate because there is nothing to regulate you cannot regulate protocol you cannot regulate the blockchain because it is decentralized there is no like uh, entity to put the regulation and to push that regulation for and uh, yeah but but people there is the like there is awkward situation because people feels more secure when there is a regulation so when uh, when there is a certain rules how you have to act uh, who is responsible for what so uh, basically it's 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 quite a difficult situation when People, when they are, you know, when the market is good, when everything is right, so people are telling just don't, you know, we don't need to be protected. We're just do know what we are doing. But uh, when things go south and when things go not so easy, so then they want to be, you know, secure and some they have some regulation. Uh, regulations is needed actually more for, you know, for classical finances, for banks, for, uh, for uh, fintechs that are you know currently they are like not able to provide services because of that missing regulation part so how to but uh, uh currently there are lots of fintechs who are working around that you know and, and providing services onboarding and servicing the the, the crypto uh, ecosystem and, and everything and uh, that is something i think that is is good for for for, for the market but apart from that, we always try to push regulator not to overregulate, not to regulate that, for example, something that could be basically self-regulated because still everything in crypto world is about ecosystem, how ecosystem works, how the decentralized you know, uh, ecosystem is engaged. And it is more about you know, how, how they themselves are feeling about that and how the market rules are settling in, into that space itself and uh and that's it wonderful so one thing that we haven't touched now but which is closely related, closely related both to technology and the regulations is a type of blockchain right so there are public and private blockchains and we did hear that let's say china has banned any cryptocurrencies or any kind of that thing which is related to public blockchains However, there are even government type of uh, scholarships and government type projects where they're building on 
permission blockchain, right? So um, maybe you could a little bit explain the difference and then we of course go into this, how it impacts the business development before we sort of start to closing, slowly closing the, the yeah. webinar. So last year, the Gartner uh, uh, like research, like actually they underlined that uh, private uh, blockchains actually failed uh, and they failed because that, you know, that problem of trust still is not solved because of the centralized, you know, uh, way of how that architecture, how that blockchain is working. So I think, you know, with that way, so what is the difference with uh, like private and, and public? So usually the private blockchains, they solve the trust issue, not of the market. So they are not solving the issue with, uh, with, with within itself but it is solving the trust issue uh, for themselves, for that centralized entity, which is uh, holding that infrastructure. So for example, if I am a big uh, corporate and I have lots of contra hands, I have you know, lots of service providers that I would like to, uh, to be transfer, tra transfer with me, uh, transparent with me where, and, and where I need that trust with them. So the private works, but if I'm trying to know, to, to trust, with me, I'm, I'm solving trust issue with me. I will never solve that with private uh, blockchain. And the only ultimate trust problem could, be, could can be solved with with public chains. And that is the biggest uh, biggest you know uh, difference in my opinion. Uh, so uh, sorry, Andrew, yeah, Sasha, I, could, would you like to add to this because this is quite important element, and this is something that. Uh, totally defines the way we develop business or integrate into to the, to the business, right? So uh, maybe, Sasha, you could uh, say a few words about that. Yeah, I agree on this front, at least like in our ecosystem, um, we see a little bit of applications related to private, but it, it's not private blockchain, it's private shards in our blockchain. And we see uh, interest in, in businesses within our ecosystem. So it's not like big businesses or anything. Uh, in uh, in using some of these private shards, for example, NFT marketplace in our ecosystem is interested in having private communication between uh, different parties, like so buyers and sellers of NFTs on this marketplace, and so they're working with a private shards provider for this. But uh, completely agree that public blockchains is like the, kind of like the main focus list for us. But then there is a, an opportunity for like privacy within the different use cases as opposed to like private blockchains. Right. So summarizing, basically private blockchain is still centralized entity to some extent, whereas public blockchain is something that you are not controlling. It's totally decentralized. And that's sort of why we see the different regulatory responses to those type of blockchains in a way that, that, that they are adopted, right? Fantastic. We are running out of time. And um, now towards the end of the webinar, uh, could we discuss about future of blockchain related innovations and how would you see how will you envision uh, blockchain coming into international business? Maybe let's start with Laura. I think overall the future of blockchain is bright overall, because otherwise I wouldn't be in this industry. And I want to be my building my business there. The thing is, we need education and we need more talent coming here. We need more young people building businesses, failing, learning, building again, failing again, and learning again. Because this is an industry that we're still in such an early uh, stage. Uh, other key things that are worth mentioning: stablecoins definitely going to be a big part of it. Then we have utility-based NFTs. We didn't touch a lot on NFTs, but basically NFTs that bring some kind of utility could be an access pass, could be let's say skins in the game or other uh, other uh, uh, things will definitely be used uh, more and more uh, in the industry. Number three. It's going to be uh, probably more bigger corporations looking into blockchain, doing so, uh, incubators, collaborating with uh, some companies to bring innovation into them, uh, basically, uh, companies. And then number four, where I see a big opportunity for everyone here in the audience as well, is just creating course lectures, just explaining what blockchain is, how it can be used for a strong application point of view, but then also encouraging people to join blockchain companies. You shouldn't, if you want to be in blockchain, you don't have to start building your business yourself. You can join a business. You can start being part of the community. You can 
uh, go to the event and listen in. There are a lot of ways how you can get exposed to the industry. And we need people like you in the audience, basically preaching, saying, hey, students, like, look into this event, look in this company, maybe build some uh, partnership with companies who can take students as interns to learn about it. Because nowadays, we as companies, we need talent. We need good talent. And we're ready to basically raise the talent and teach them on what are the skills they need for the future to succeed. Fantastic. Thank you, Laura. Andrew, how about you? Yeah, I think uh, that the world the world is holding on optimists and innovations is built on dreamers, you know. And uh, I believe in, you know, decentralized and this uh, fully free internet, next generation internet, you can call it whatever you want it. But the blockchain is actually enabling that in full and uh, uh, also that decentralization is actually helping the innovation because uh, let's uh, let's agree that the, the speed that industry is moving is actually like like if you have like in fintechs you have a usual car or sports car so in the, in the blockchain it's like a, you have a plane with afterburner because everything is so fast and I think that that speed is due to that you know decentralization that everyone can build every everyone can participate. There are low, like new types of uh, opportunities to attract the investment, to engage the communities, to build your vision. And uh, uh, my advice is never, you know, never do what everyone is doing. You already just focus on what is your dream and try to build something new because the block blockchain uh, opens the new opportunities. Uh, the metaverse, the new, you know, virtual reality, virtual world, which is, I think, uh, it depends on us. It will be beautiful or ugly. Wonderful, wonderful. Sasha, what you would like to say for, for the future vision? And uh, maybe also you would like to say a few words about the podcast that you have been co-creating and, and investing a lot of time. So sort of we have we have a chance to learn about the future as well. Yeah, uh, on a podcast, yeah, I have a podcast. I do a lot of, with, alongside with other many things, uh, here is a podcast. I just dropped a link here. Uh, it's called Next Creators. Uh, it's mostly conversations with uh, next creators. <laughs> uh, so people who built in, in the blockchain founders and uh, uh, different type of creators. I think there's a blurry line between creator and founder. Um, in terms of where blockchain, I think, will go in the next couple of years, at least what I see in our ecosystem. So we we're a newer blockchain we saw a lot of as i mentioned kind of like things where people like uh build things that already exist in other blockchains so like a lot of decentralized finance uh some of the nft marketplaces we have a lot of DAOs. we have like 150 or so active weekly DAOs. uh that's decentralized autonomous organizations think of it as like facebook groups with a bank account uh, i have one DAO as well where we're making decisions about funding games uh there um the next couple of years i think we'll see a lot more things going towards like social. So I'm starting to see that uh, and interoperable. So like I'm starting to see that people want to start using um, different um, uh, pieces related to people in different contexts. So more towards this open web, meaning that, for example, you help somebody in hackathon in one place and maybe you can get access to online only, sorry, access only online event in a virtual space in like metaverse, one of those uh, virtual worlds. And so we're starting to see this kind of interest in projects doing uh, uh, interoperability between their projects. We're starting to see interest in reputation, so local reputation in the context of particular application as well as global reputation, kind of like what is the reputation for overall like a system. Those are things that are happening. I think more like long term, uh, it will take many years, but like what I want to see is like uh, internet, which um, which I can pay for essentially directly so there, and, and, and a lot more applications. So millions of applications is what I want to see, but niche applications. So for example, I live in San Francisco and I really care about architecture and the history of architecture of this one city. Um, I'm sure there are 10,000 other people who like um, would be interested in paying like just $1 a month to this one developer who's running it. And so uh, I want to get to the place where we kind of have those applications, kind of like not one Facebook for everyone, not one Instagram for everyone, but more like all kinds of like diverse applications that people can consume and even pay for and be uh, partial owners in. So I think the big idea is blockchain, generally speaking, is like you can be owner of the digital service, the same way how you are like owner of the house. Now you can own digital services and that's a big deal. So people focus on the other aspects of the industry, how can you like make more money with this thing, as opposed to the, the more interesting part is like digital ownership is like very important piece of the blockchain. 
Um, in terms of like people uh, who want to learn more, I highly recommend to just try applications to build intuition for the space. So less of reading, um, maybe educational content, just jump in and try different things, um, kind of like through learning. Same same we had developers learn through going to like hackathons and such, and also kind of like try things and figure things out as uh, things work and don't work. So I think that's the best thing you can do for yourself is like get a wallet on, on one of the blockchains, ideally the more user-friendly one. And then uh, because blockchain still is <laughs> not super user-friendly, let's just call it, um, and uh, give it a try. Just uh, try a couple applications, see see, see what you think. J join a couple of Discord servers. But, and another piece, last piece I wanted to mention is the big also underappreciated aspect of blockchains is that businesses are built fully in open, meaning that it's not just open source, right? Actual businesses being in, built in open. So what I mean by this is that, let's say I used to work in like enterprise software company. There are only people who work in this particular company who have access to this floor where people work there can talk to CEO maybe one day versus in the blockchain, you can actually jump into Discord of any server and talk to the founder directly. And so you can literally, if you want to join blockchain, you can join 25 Discords of different projects and talk to the founders directly and get all of the information that you need and figure out what you want to do with it. And it's like this openness like really helps people. They can like take advantage of it if, if, if they want to kind of like find the opportunities in space. Fantastic, fantastic discussion and fantastic learning. We already have requests to, re to have a sort of follow-up of the discussion. Let's see if we manage to arrange it, but thank you so much. Uh, we've learned a lot and there are some questions, a lot of questions that came in and we didn't manage to answer them. Yet in the discussion, we'll try to get it as much as we can now after the webinar and in the handout. And uh, we'll try to sort of provide as much of material also together with the recording. So thank you all for, for this fascinating evening, morning or afternoon, wherever you're joining. And uh, I hand out now the, the, the screen to Tamir. Thank you so much, Austrian. Uh, definitely agree with you. This has been a very interesting, very enlightening, very fascinating discussion. I learned a lot. I have a lot of notes here, uh, quick takeaways. Uh, I learned, for example, that if you're a startup entrepreneur, there's a lot more for you in blockchain technology than, let's say, established firms. Uh, if your model requires a decentralized uh, mo operating model, uh, it's blockchain, obviously, is it. And also the ecosystem, developing the ecosystem, I think Sasha was talking about this, is very critical. So lots of good points there. Uh, lots of educational uh, points there. And I think our participants all agree. There's a lot of praise. And I really appreciate all of you uh, uh, taking, uh, taking questions and comments in the chat room and responding to them as well. So the recording will be available uh, uh, next week uh, on our website. I, I wanna thank everybody here, Laura, uh, Andreas and Sasha. And of course, Osreen, you did a tremendous job of moderating this discussion. It's been, again, very, very beneficial for me. We thank everybody who joined us today. Uh, have a good rest of your day. And I really appreciate all of our panelists today because they joined us at an awkward time. It's uh, late evening for all of them, I believe. Uh, so thank you. And we'll see you this fall in September in, in additional webinars. Thank you so much.